Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host over here. I'm Simon, and uh, also known as your Casual Criminalist. Not really. I'm evidently the boy with the blaze. There's an in-joke on one of my other channels, which uh, just always gets brought up whenever I say anything else. Uh, what happens here is uh, Callum has written me a script. I have it in front of me right here. If you're watching this show on YouTube, you can see that. And if you are watching on YouTube, you need to smash that like button. If you're listening on the podcast, well, there's no like button for you to smash. But uh, I'd appreciate a review as always. Uh, today we have Theodore Ed- Ed- Edward Connays. Connies. I should probably look that up. This guy's not famous enough to make it into my pronunciation dictionary, so we're just going to go with Connie's. I'm sorry if I'm getting that wrong. If you're a listener to a few episodes of the show already, you'll probably be... Did I say already that Callum writes this? I will read it. I've not read this before. It's brand new to me. We explore it together. And uh, then Jen, our wonderful video and audio editor, will add in some music and some pictures and uh, all of that good stuff. Let's jump in. If you've listened to a few episodes of the show already, you're probably well aware that we don't take too kindly to ghost stories muddying the waters of our true crime cases. Oh god, of course we don't. <laughs> Callum and I, I really like that we're on the same page with this. Because whenever someone's like, you know, you're listening to some true crime thing, and then someone's like, some people say it's ghosts. I'm like, well, let's just ignore those people and actually investigate the crime. And, you know, or <laughs> just like, it's not ghosts. Like the world's greatest detective Scooby-Doo, we're all about ripping that dollar store mask off and revealing the human culprit hiding underneath. Often, what you find is far more disturbing than any ghost or goblin. Still, there are some criminal cases out there which send a chill up the spine of even the most staunch rationalist. That's because what they reveal is a troubling fact. Some houses really are haunted, just not in the way you might expect. That's what we'll be exploring in today's case, the tale of a real-life haunting with deadly consequences. Fair war- Warning, this one has the potential to set your paranoia ablaze, so if you live alone, you might want to give this one a miss. But if you've got the nerve to stick with us, prepare for your nightmares to be fueled with the face of Theodore Edward Coney's The Denver Spider-Man. A Supernatural Slaying it's the 17th of October, 1941. Septuagenarian, that means someone in their 70s. Look, Callum. You often use, I feel like sometimes you put in words that, that might baffle me just for fun. But I, I do know septuagenarian. Phil Peters is living alone at his house on the north side of Denver, while his wife recovers from a fractured hip in hospital. This was back when even knowing how a stove worked was enough to brand a man a pansy, so the retired railroad official has been had been collecting his evening meals from a neighbor while his wife was away from home. Ah, the past. I mean... Not when there was no Uber Eats, not when men didn't know how to cook. I still don't know how to cook. No, I do. In fact, I would say I probably do more cooking than my wife. Although, no, we've we've got a kid now. And she tends to cook a bit more because she will cook the... the I mean, kid is a baby. Um, it's a baby. She's a baby. <laughs> oh, I hope my wife doesn't listen to this. Uh, she probably does more cooking now. Why are we talking about my cooking and my home life? This isn't why we're here. <laughs> This evening, he was late for dinner. Darkness came, and the neighbor waited a little while to see if anyone would eventually turn up. Phil had been struggling to adjust to life alone in the house, so she worried that he was holed up in a depression, or worse, that he could have taken a fall down the stairs. When she went round to check up on the old man, she found all the lights on the ho- in the house were turned off. Strange, as he would have checked in first if he had somewhere else to be. Nobody answered when she rang the doorbell either. The Good Samaritan went to enlist the help of some other neighbors who resolved to get inside and check if Mr. Peters was all right. The place was locked up tight though. Every window and door was bolted shut. Eventually, one girl managed to pull back a window screen far enough to clamber inside while the others lifted her up. After scrambling up from the floor of the house, she called out to the elderly elderly occupants but there was no reply. She crept through the rooms, not wanting to startle him if he was still in sight. It was her who got the fright, however, when the girl made it through to the downstairs bedroom, and she found Mr. Peter's body lying in a pool of blood and screamed loud enough that everyone outside could hear. Wait, so (laughs) it's like we've gone to a potential crime scene. (laughs) They're like, hey, small girl, can you go inside rather than call the police who will break down the door? So this girl is absolutely traumatized by... (laughs) 
<laughs> finding this guy lying in a pool of blood. That's going to take a lot of therapy if it wasn't the 1940s. Uh, the worst fears were conf confirmed. In fact, they were exceeded. Not only was Mr. Peters dead, he had been viciously murdered. Phil Pete, yeah, not many people die and then it's, well, I suppose you could crack your head on something and then be in a pool of your own blood. But most of the time you're going to be like, murder murder or suicide either way not something you as a little girl would particularly want to come across phil peters had over a dozen skull fractures okay now it's definitely murder <laughs> alongside many more bruises and lacerations on his body suggesting a brutally violent end it appeared that many of the worst injuries were inflicted even after death as his attacker continued attacking the corpse crazy people gonna be crazy nothing appeared to have been stolen from the house so the incident was unlikely to have been a burglary gone wrong even more mysterious was the fact that there was no indication that any had come or gone from the house the police like the neighbors who came before them found every entrance to the house locked from the inside there was no oh no oh no remember i've not seen these before and i'm just seeing that cal did i read the alternate title for this episode <laughs> callum wrote the title as well as the denver spider-man the ghost in the attic there was a dude hiding in the attic of this guy's house right and he came down and murdered him is that what's gone on because if that's the case that is scary i don't like it I don't like it at all. <laughs> I'm trying to work it out, and I think I think that's that's what's happened. I'm like now I'm just in my office alone. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what if there's someone in that room I haven't been in in ages, <laughs> living in there like a weirdo? There was no sign of forced entry apart from the window screen, which was caused by the neighbors who broke a, broke inside to find the body. Whoever had killed Phil Peters had simply disappeared into thin air. Spooky sightings. A few months after the murder, Mrs. Peter's hip was fully healed, and she faced the grim prospect of returning to the home where her husband was beaten to death, the same home they had shared together since 1899. To make matters worse, some unsettling rumors started to spread around the neighborhood. The house was supposed to be unoccupied by a group, of, but a group of children reported seeing uh, uh, light flickers on and off in one of the windows. This might have been explained away by the overactive imaginations of young'uns, but just days later, a woman from the neighborhood claimed she spotted a ghostly face peer out at her from a darkened window. Well, one police, did you not search the building when you found like a murdered guy in there? Were you not like, let's let's check in the attic, let's check in the cellar, just to be sure. Yeah, no, I feel like that's kind of mandatory when someone's been murdered in a building and they're like, no one came or went. They're just like, it's ghosts. <laughs> it's not ghosts. Instead, a family enlisted the help of a home care nurse and a housekeeper who took up residence in one of the spare rooms. This was a short-lived arrangement because soon the nurse started to hear strange scratching noises from inside the walls and found objects left out of place in the morning. Why are people like this ghosts? It's the crazy murder in the attic. Her creeping sense of dread came to a head one cold January evening when she stepped out of her room in the middle of the night to investigate a sound and had an encounter with the ghostly presence itself. Years later, she told the Denver Post, Just a few minutes ago, I heard a sort of tapping. I had heard it before, but I thought it was only just some woodpeckers. But this time, I walked into the kitchen and I saw the door to the stairway that leads upstairs slowly open. Then the spectre started to slip through the doorway. A foot came out, and then I saw a thin white hand on the door. I screamed, and the man ducked back into the stairway, and I heard him running up the steps. The nurse very sensibly noped right out of there after a brush with the supernatural. <laughs> it's not the supernatural. Why is everyone always like this? It's a ghost. No, it's an actual man. If I saw a ghost, I'd be like, well, either, you know, I've uh, I, my natural thing would be like, okay, it's a person. Okay, there's no person there. Then my brain definitely had some sort of weird hallucination fart problem, and I should probably go get an MRI or take less drugs. Allegedly. Uh, she probably dropped it off her resignation letter. She never returned to the house. The police were called that night, but by the time they arrived, there was no sight of the intruder. They chalked it up to another case of silly superstition. Why are the police always so bad in the casual criminalist? Why are the police so incompetent? At the time, she never really uh, revealed exactly why she was leaving, just that she believed the house was haunted with an evil spirit. Stop it. One of the neighbors decided to take her place rather than leave the poor bereaved woman, uh, old woman to fend for herself. It wasn't long before she had a similar experience of the paranormal. When she heard something topple over downstairs late at night, she crept down the stairs to check it out. Near the entrance of the kitchen, she spotted the ghost. It was a ragged and demonic looking thing, wearing tattered rags with long spindly limbs and yellowed eyes. When she screamed, the apparition disappeared from sight and was nowhere to be found when the police arrived. Did they check in the attic? Did they did they check the attic? That that would be nice. Come on, guys. 
Rather than leave his mother at the mercy of a demon, Mrs. Peter's son demanded that she move in with him until something could be done about the strange happenings at the house. Given the similar reports given by two separate witnesses, police officers were posted on lookout across the street from the now empty home. This only lasted a few weeks when, given the lack of any spooky happenings, the surveillance was abandoned. Over the following months, officers would go back to check on the place in case the mystery man showed himself again. Okay, so the police are kind of on it. Then they must have searched the they must have searched the house if they're staking out the house. So where did the guy hide? I mean, unless it really is a ghost. It's not really a ghost. It's, if you believed me, we don't know each other yet. You'll get to know me. I, I don't believe in any of this nonsense. Could you tell? The little gothic ghost hunting assignment wasn't their usual beat, and they probably expected it to be pretty uneventful. It was just a bit of daft superstition after all. Right? Spider-Man. Home squatting. <laughs> That might be how things usually turn out in these cases, but the two cops sent out for a routine check on July the 30th, 1942, were in for the shock of their lives. Late that afternoon, the postman came down the street doing his evening rounds. The officers watched as he dropped off some mail at the Peters mailbox, at which point they caught sight of movement at the living room window, the flash of a face between the curtains. They rushed across the street to investigate, forcing open the front door to the abandoned home. By this point, everything was caked in a thick layer of dust, kicked up in thick clouds with each step. They listened for any sign of movement. A long second passed without any sound. Then suddenly, they heard the click of a latch on the second floor. Someone was in the house after all. The officers ran upstairs to the source of the sound, a closet door at the end of the hall. After one of them swung it open, the pair spotted a pair of bony feet dangling from the ceiling. Obviously, neither of the men had seen the grudge, so they had no issue protruding, pursuing the skeletal apparition into the attic hatch through which it was fleeing. Wait, I've never seen the grudge, so I'll be like, I mean, I'd definitely hesitate. I'd definitely take out my gun. As an American police officer, I'd have one of those. I'd be like, yo, get down from there. I'm not coming up there, you weirdo. Get down or I'm going to like start shooting. I'm a police officer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Detective Roy Bloxham leapt into the cupboard and reached up through the hole in the roof, snatching a scrap of cloth from the tattered trousers of the figure, then catching hold of its ankle. He was able to wrench it back through the tiny passageway and bring the murderous ghost tumbling down to the ground with a piercing cry. <laughs> it's not a ghost! To their relief, the scrawny figure that lay on the ground before them was no vengeful spirit! Shocking! <laughs> It was a flesh and blood human. What? A man who had been knocked unconscious in the struggle. Still, he looked about as close to the living dead as any man can be, starved and ragged with long wild hair and a filthy beard. He was so thin that jagged bones poked through pale white skin all over his body and the clothes on his back were rotting away. While they waited for an ambulance to arrive, one of the men decided to poke his head through the hole in the ceiling. Uh, that's all about all he could fit through the tiny opening. Officers had noticed the hatch previously, but its small size meant that they ruled out the possibility of any grown adult being able to get through it. The occupants never bothered using it anyway, and it was jammed shut when the cops tried to open it, so they decided to just leave it that way. That is, I mean, guys... <laughs> There's obviously enough space for a person up there if this dude was living up there. You could at least just pop your head into it, couldn't you? Now, though, they were able to look inside. It was a tiny space, just 27 inches high and 57 wide. The sort of place that costs a thousand pounds a month in London. <laughs> yes, that's how dehumanizing the ghostly occupant's existence was. That is very, very small. I don't really know inches, but I know 12 inches is about 30 centimeters, so that's what... I know a f how much a foot is, roughly. It's so like three foot by six foot. That is very small. That is very small. Okay, I kind of get why they didn't look in there. It's more like it's just the size of a box. By the looks of it, he had been living in there for some time. An ironing board was laid out on the floor as a makeshift bed, piled with filth encrusted bedding and old magazines. Spider webs hung thick around the single dim light bulb illuminating the place. The stench was so overpowering that the officer could only bear to look for a few moments before pulling his head out and returning to the main mystery below. At that point, he'd be like, and that's why I'm a police officer and I don't work in for forensics have fun guys did they have forensics in the 1940s? i guess like super basic forensics right so who the hell was this filthy miscreant lying on the floor in front of them the detectives called their captain an officer named james childers who went on to become chief of police years later he recounted his experience of that day with the descriptive power of a frustrated novelist telling the press how he was uh how he was faced with the strangest looking human i have ever seen he was a tall man just under six feet but thin as a wilted weed i'm just under six feet and no one ever calls me a particularly tall man thank you i suppose <laughs> 
His dirty hair hung low over his ears, and his skin was the ugly, unwashed gray of an overcast sky. This strange, sickly character would later pick up the name The Denver Spider-Man of Moncrief Place on account of his arachnid-like lifestyle. The press cooked up the nickname when Detective Fred Zano told him about the crawl space abode, saying, A man would have to be a spider to stand being up there. He was the first person to fully enter the attic, having drawn the short straw as the smallest build of the officers at the precinct. When Zano climbed up to get a better look at the place, he ended up vomiting from the stench. The forensics guys would be like, ah, oh, well done. You've contaminated all of our evidence. Stashed away up there, he found a stock of canned foods, a homemade radio, and a power outlet rerouted from the home's main supply. By this point, the occupants had been carted off to recover from the ordeal under police custody. To find out the Spider-Man's true identity, the detectives would have to wait until he was back on his feet. Who was he? Once the skeletal squatter regained consciousness, he proved surprisingly compliant for a murderous attic goblin. <laughs> Given his condition, all it took was a few good meals and a hot cup of coffee to coax him into sharing his life story. What is go what persuaded this guy? He's got to be crazy, right? He must be crazy. As it turns out, he began living as a spider after going on an ill-fated high school field trip and witnessing the tragic murder of his uncle Ben, who Oh no, hold on, wrong Wikipedia. <laughs> I was like, wait, that guy sounds young. Oh, because that's the Spider-Man origin story. I'm so dumb. Yes. The origins of uh, story of Denver's very own Spider-Man was actually far from, uh, was a far more depressing tale than that. Born in 1882 as Theodore Edward, Edward Conies, he lost his father. I know I'm pronouncing that name Conies different every time. I'm so sorry. He lost his father at just five years old. He and his mother moved around several cities before eventually settling down in Denver. Young Theodore was a troubled kid and ended up dropping out of high school at an early age. It was in part due to health problems which plagued him throughout his life. Theodore was told from a young age that he wouldn't live to adulthood. Every time his mother sought a fresh opinion from a new doctor, they told him her the same thing. Her son would be lucky to see 18. He was nearing that fatal deadline when he made the acquaintance of a man in his 20s named Philip Peters who shared his interest in music. After meeting at a club for guitar and mandolin players, the sickly youth would often come to Peter's home, which he hadn't long since bought with his new wife. He'd stop by from time to time for a jam with the rest of the mandolin crew, or just to have dinner with the newlyweds. This kind of social contact was bittersweet for the young man. The company of friends largely just served to embitter Theodore against the world that was denied to him by his ailing health. He had no girlfriends growing up, and his mother prevented him from getting a job or playing sports. As a result, he became an outcast among his peers, preferring a reclusive life to their constant mockery. Eventually, he even stopped coming around to Philip Peter's house. It would be several decades before he graced the doorstep again. In the interim, he swung from crisis to crisis, beginning with the bankruptcy and death of his mother, who was scammed of her life savings and home. After she passed, Theodore Connes took off into the world. He lived far longer than every doctor's estimation, but without ever finding much worth living for. After stints uh, spent sleeping rough, he managed to land an advertising job at the Denver Brassworks, but he wasn't able to stick it out for long. Eventually, he was forced into the life of a hobo during America's Great Depression, traveling to California and sleeping under a bridge, then slowly moving from state to state until he reached New York. There, he took up a job as a salesman, which fell through within a few months. That was Coney's last attempt at fitting in with normal society. Time and again, he was beaten and battered down, and now all he wanted was a quiet spot to escape the world for the rest of his days. The Murder In September 1941, he decided to retreat back to Denver, where he sought out the charity of some old acquaintances. High on those people he planned to contact was Peter Phillips, one of the few people who had treated him with genuine kindness in his teenage years. Coney's made his way back to 3335 West Moncrief Place for the first time in nearly three decades. When he got there, he found nobody home. He tried the door, which had been left unlocked, as was the norm in that safe part of town. At first, he only intended to steal some food and money, but as he wandered around the empty house, another notion crept into his mind. Wait, <laughs> so he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go see my old friends, see if they'll... Uh you know, take me in and make sure I'm doing all right and all of that stuff. Oh, they're not home. In that case, I'll just steal from my friends. No worries. Now in his 60s, the elderly invalid's health was in a poor state. One more winter spent sleeping rough would probably be the death of him and look how much space his old acquaintance had in this warm, comfortable home. He searched around for a hidden spot to rest his head and eventually found the tiny attic hatch in the closet. I am really wondering how long this dude lived in the attic now. 
And why did he end up murdering the person? They must have caught him or something. Anyway, anyone with a normal frame would have struggled to fit through, but Coney's was stick thin from living off scraps for years. He was able to slip through without issue and fell into the best sleep that he had enjoyed in weeks. While the Denver Spider Man slept in the tiny cubby hole, he heard the legal occupant of the home <laughs> return downstairs. Oh, that is so creepy. Just lock your doors, even if you're in a safe part of town. I'm like, I'm always locking the door. <laughs> Rather than crawl out of the ceiling for an unhappy reunion, he decided to stay completely still and maintain his secret hiding place as long as possible. Even if he let out the odd stifled cough, Peters was in his 70s and he didn't have the best hearing. His visitor soon realized this and got bolder in his wanderings around the home. At first, the spider in the attic would only descend whenever Phillips left the house, but eventually he graduated to far creepier methods. In his statement to police, he was quoted as saying, Whenever I heard him downstairs, I kept real still. Then I got bolder and used to shadow him from room to room. <laughs> what are you doing? It was sort of a game. It gave me a thrill. It was the first time in my life I'd ever had anyone at my mercy, but I didn't want to hurt him. Y you're a disturbed individual, Spidey. But that is exactly what he did. Yes, we knew that. On that night in October, about five weeks after the unwanted visitor set up in the attic crawl space, he was caught red-handed at the refrigerator door. He thought his host had gone out for the evening to visit his wife, but actually he had been sleeping on the couch. Uh-oh. When old man Phillips found the disheveled hobo raking through his refrigerator, he swung at him with his cane. A struggle ensued, and Coney's managed to get his hands on an old handgun, which he used to beat his old friend around the head. Yeah, because normally when I'm in a fight and you get a gun, you're like, yeah, let's beat him with the gun rather than use the gun. Although I guess, especially if you're going to kill the guy, it's a gun. Phillips fled the living room, but his attacker landed another solid hit before he could call for help. The gun broke apart from the impact and Phillips fell down unconscious. So Coney's let him be. At this point, he claimed he only planned to steal money and then make a break for it. Seconds later, though, he heard the homeowner stumbling to the master bedroom, so Coney's grabbed an iron poker from the side of the stove and knocked Phillips down again and kept beating the elderly man's skull until he was dead. 37 devastating strikes in total. I mean, what's this? Wasn't his skull fractured 12 times? Good lord. After brutally murdering his unwitting landlord, Coney, Coney's cleared the murder weapon, cleaned the murder weapon, and retreated to his squalid little fortress of solitude. Dude, it is time to leave. Like, this is an example, as we always have on the Crash of Criminalist, of cat criminals being dumb. You can't stay there. You have to go. It's time to run away. You've been on the run for... I mean, not on the run, but living rough as a hobo for the better part of 40 years. You probably know how to hide from the police. He was still there when the commotion unfolded downstairs and the police came to investigate his crime. In fact, he had been sitting on top of the hatch when the cops tried to open it. Ah, so they did search, and they were like, ah, I guess nothing's behind this hatch holding it shut. Thankfully for Coney's, those cold callers left his little doorway that evening, and he was free to continue living in the crawl space for many more months. People downstairs came and went, and he endured a few close calls when he was spotted during those nighttime kitchen raids. Few of the reports made any mention of his toilet situation, and to be honest, we should probably consider that a blessing. I'll just leave it up to your imagination yeah i don't want to i was thinking about that <laughs> and then i'd stopped thinking about it and now i'm thinking about it again great so through the chilly colorado winter coney's teeth chattered throughout the night with the freezing temperatures in his hideaway but still it was better than anything the outside world could offer him this was the sort of lifestyle he had been dreaming of completely sealed away from society yeah living in a six foot by three foot box the dream. Once his victim's family finally vacated the house, he had finally achieved the reclusive solitude he had been craving all his life. His only contact with the outside world was the odd scowling glimpse of the mailman before scurrying back to his miserable little man cave. The life of your average Twitch streamer, basically. Oh, some shade, Callum. A terrifying trend. Before we wrap up the story of the Denver Spider-Man, we need to take a look at the wider phenomenon which he's a part of. This is the part which is going to have you jumping at every little bump and creak in your home over the next few nights. Don't tell me this is becoming a common thing. Because although the story of Theodore Edward Coney's is pretty insane, it's actually far from uncommon. In fact, there have been cases of secret squatters secretly popping up all, over, uh, all around the world. For example, in 2018, a man in the Japanese city of Himeji went to visit his 90-year-old mother who lived by herself. While he was cooking dinner for her, he heard a bang from upstairs and went up to investigate. No other rooms, he found a young man sleeping on a futon on the floor. What? Not even hiding in the attic brazenly, just on a futon. 
He had no idea who the man was, and neither did his mother, so he called the police. As it turns out, the 20-year-old had likely been living there for about five months, although he refused to give any details to the police after his arrest, not even his name. He probably picked the home of the elderly woman, knowing that she wouldn't hear him upstairs, and that she had pretty much written off the second floor of her home since she became too frail to tackle the stairs. Despite squatting in the woman's home and stealing her food, the young guy wasn't a total animal. In true Japanese fashion, he was polite enough to leave his shoes at the front door when he entered, and somehow nobody knew. Noticed. So I assumed he was like coming and going through a window or something. No, no, he's just strolling straight into the house. I, at least this, this guy doesn't sound like a psyche. He just sounds like someone who didn't want to pay rent or for food. Pretty much the exact same thing happened in Jiangsu Province, China in 2014. A man named in the papers as Mr. Wang discovered that money and food had gone missing from his apartment and eventually tracked the culprit to a crawl space above his ceiling. The stairway had been living there for about three months after accessing the space from the outside. I really want to go check that room that I haven't been in in a while right now. <laughs> Dropping into the top two floor apartments to loot their piggy banks and fridges from time to time. The squatter even had the audacity to sneak down and use Mr. Wang's kitchen while he was away at work. These stories are relatively harmless compared to the Denver Spider-Man. No harm was done apart from a little bit of petty theft. But the idea of an unwanted tenant in your home is creepy nonetheless. Yes, it is. As we've already seen, potential for these situations to boil over into violence is very, very real. Yeah, I mean, these guys are like different levels of criminals, but still criminals. And the things could go bad. Sometimes, though, the motives are about more than just finding a warm place to sleep. In 2012, a, war a woman in South Carolina woke up to a thunderous racket from above her ceiling, far too loud to be an animal. Initially, she thought she was being haunted by a poltergeist, but, well, <laughs> of course she was. Of course she did. It's like, why would that be a person? It's much more likely to be a ghost. Number of ghosts you've seen, zero. Number of people you've seen, t hundreds of thousands, millions? But when she called her adult sons for help, they discovered an ex-boyfriend's living in her attic. Dude, no. The woman had broken up with him over 12 years ago, surely before he went to prison. Oh, this could have gone badly wrong. He didn't take it particularly well and wrote her regular love letters from the inside. Oh, no. After his release, he went straight to her house and took up residence in the attic for two weeks. Worst of all, he had been watching her sleep through a ceiling vent the whole time. I wonder how many listeners just glanced over at their air vents just then. <laughs> Oh, I don't like it. Look, I turned around to look at my air vents. One more story before we move on, and it's by far the most unsettling of all. American writer Grady Hendrix told the story of a similar encounter on Twitter, writing how he stumbled across an intruder in his kitchen as a kid in the 1980s. His sightings were written off as fantasy by his parents until their unwelcome guest ended up passing away while hiding inside the walls. Oh, God. <laughs> According to Hendrix, the thing that alerted them to the situation were maggots dropping through the air vents in his room. Dude, no. That is insane. The recently deceased squatter had set up a foam pad next to the vent to watch the kid in secret. What? I think it might be time to board up those air vents for good. Yeah, screw that. I don't want air vents anymore. I don't need fresh air. Similar stories have come out of Washington, Fukuoka, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Queensland, Ohio, and on, and on, and on. Oh, God. There's a startling abundance of these cases out there, so much so that it really makes you wonder how many secret squatters have gotten away with it, completely undetected. I'm glad I live in a relatively small apartment. Even my office, it's like, okay, there's like a small room I haven't been into in a while, but it's very small. I don't think there's anyone living in there. I haven't heard anything weird. But if I did, I would be like, it's a ghost. I'd go and check to see if there's a weirdo living in my office. As for our original secret squatter, the Spider-Man of Denver, he had been wrenched out of his cozy little corner and offered a sweet new pad at the Colorado State Penitentiary, where he was to serve a life sentence. Good. After shacking up in the tiny attic coffin for over half a year, it was probably quite nice to have heating and a mattress to sleep on. When he was sentenced, he's reported to have said, now I feel safe. I'll have a better home than I've had in years. I was thinking during this whole thing, it's like, dude, prison actually sounds like an upgrade. He spent the rest of his life behind bars in relative comfort before passing away in 1967, a full 67 years older than doctors had ever expected him to live for. Like his fictional namesake, the Denver Spider-Man was tougher than anyone expected. He endured far more than his fair share of hardship over the years, never quite able to establish himself in a world that kept beating him down. Don't get me wrong. That is no excuse for housebreaking and certainly is not an excuse for murder. But you have to admit that neither Theodore Coney's nor any of those who came before him would have even bothered to sneak into anyone's home in the first place had there been some alternative available. Apart from that South Carolina vet pervert, we've got zero sympathy for him. Yes, a weirdo.
But while homelessness continues to plague even the most developed nations, and shelters around the world are packed capacity each night, these kinds of stories will continue to emerge from time to time. Meaning, the next time you hear a creaking in the walls, or you sway had an extra can of beer in the fridge, it could actually be a sign that you've got an unwelcome plus one living under your roof. I'm kidding, of course. What are the odds that this kind of true-life gothic ghost tale have happening to you? Near zero, right? That's probably just the pipes again. Right? Right? Seriously, though, you should probably check. <laughs> Callum, no! <laughs> ah. Dismember to bend disease. Number one, the story of the original Spider-Man has left a pretty strong imprint on pop culture over the years, and I'm not just talking about the deleted scenes from The Avengers where Tom Holland climbs out of Thanos' attic and pistol whips him to death. I've never seen The Avengers, so I have no idea what Khan's going on about, but I hope you enjoyed that in-joke audience. The, the in-joke for people who've seen The Avengers, which has got to be like 90% of people, right? He was also the inspiration for a CSI plotline in an episode of The Simpsons, an eerie Stanley Gardner novel, Earl Stanley Gardner, sorry, and pretty much any media which borrowed the trope of murderous guests in the attic. Two. How about one more light-hearted secret squatter story to take the edge off? That would be really nice. Kind of nervous now. A group of male students at Ohio State University rented out a house off campus in 2013, which they joked was haunted. After breaking open the door to what they thought was a utility closet, they discovered the fully furnished room of Jeremy, a previous tenant. <laughs> what? A previous tenant who just chose not to leave. According to legitimate tenant Brett Muglin, their secret room was actually a really nice guy. <laughs> Who knows, maybe yours will be too. <laughs> What's going on, Jeremy? I mean, that's kind of genius. So, I uh, do hope you enjoyed this episode of The Casual Criminalist. I've been Simon. This was written by Callum. Thank you to Jen, who puts together the video and the audio afterwards. Uh, if you did enjoy this show, please hit that like button if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening to this as a podcast, please do leave a review. And thank you for watching and listening and all of that good stuff. And I'll see you next time.